good, everybody. My name is Luke Dems. The talk I'm doing today is on the bio, biophysical economics. So, for those who don't know about the history of biophysical economics, before uh, Charlie got involved, he was mentored by uh, Howard Odom. And Odom, in turn, was mentored intellectually by Alfred Matoka, who in 1925 published a book called uh, the physics of, bio, of biological systems. And he, in turn, was trained by uh, the, well, here's Latoka right here. He, in turn, was trained by German physical chemist Wilhelm Oswald. Excuse me, you say Latoka, it's just Latoka, isn't it? It's Latoka. Latoka. Uh, maybe I'm Latoka. Latoka. Okay, okay, Alfred, fine. So Alfred Latoka, he, in turn, was trained by German physical chemist Alfred Latoka. And he, as a student, watched Latoka, uh, Oswald give lectures, and he said that Oswald gave a lecture where he said you could use the equations of physics to model the growth of a crystal, and he also used these same equations to model the growth of a bacteria. So that that Latka had the conception to use physical principles to model biological phenomena. So in 1925, he wrote Elements of Physical Biology, and his first chapter was devoted to regarding definitions. That is. From the physical point of view, the physical chemical school would define a plant as either unknown or a physical chemical process, whereas the vitalist, vitalistic school would define a plant as a, a vital process. So as, in his first chapter, he said, from the point of view of physics, if you try to differentiate between a living thing and a non-living thing, you're going to end up with what's called Jabberwocky, which is a poem by Lewis Carroll. He wrote a poem in 1782 that used fictional words to make a poem, and they were all nonsense words. He's the author of Alice in Wonderland. So Latoka says that is the perennial debate between vitalism and mechanism quibble about words. And he says if you use physics and define a certain thing that differentiates living from non-living, you're going to have with what's called Jabberwocky. So here's one example of what we're talking about here when he says it's is it a matter of quibble about words. In the 19th century, Joel gave a speech called On Matter, Living Force, and Heat. And he said, gave it, in his speech, he said, the force possessed by a moving body is termed by the mechanical philosophers of vis viva. Now he says this term may be deemed inappropriate by some. The reason for that is vis viva is a mythological term. Viva is the Greco-Romanian goddess of life. So, before that, Newton and Leibniz were all using the bis viva. Bis morta was the precursor to potential energy, coined by William McCorn Rankin, one of the founders of thermodynamics in 1853. And bis viva was rebranded as kinetic energy by Thompson, or Lord Kelvin, for those who don't know, in 1862. So he switched out of anthropomorphic or mythological terminology. And now we can say that they the potential energy is converted into kinetic energy. You can scale this up and use it to explain social systems or ecological systems, but if you use this mythological terminology or anthropomorphic, Mor is also the greco romanian goddess of death. So when you're speaking about the potential energy, you can't say that the vis viva is converted into vis mortu anymore. So the upgrade of that is that life is coming under attack as a nonsense concept according to physics and chemistry. So Michael Brooks in 2005 published a, a very famous article in New Scientist where he said the top 13 things in science that don't make sense are the missing universe phenomenon, the dark matter problem, the pioneer anomaly, number two, why satellites are accelerating away from Earth and they don't match up with Newton's laws of gravitation. And number five is are you just a bag of chemicals? And then he went around in 2007 and wrote a whole book called 13 Things That Don't Make Sense. And these sites, Schrodinger, everyone knows that Schrodinger said life is uh, anything that feeds on negative entropy. Well, that came under attack by Linus Pauling. He says that's nonsense. And these sites, Kaufman, who talked about what uh, Robert Aries was talking about in his speech about the uh, chemoton theory, is kind of what, what Kaufman talks about. That If you look into that, that's chemical perpetual motion. This is how I got involved in it. I started in 1995 as a chemical engineer mapping, using chemical thermodynamics to map chem chemical reactions. So a human reproduction reaction is a double displacement reaction. You can see the molecular formula for a human here. 
calculated by me of 2002, cited by Harvard's bio numbers. So people who go to medical school right now at Harvard learn this molecular formula. Human is a 26 element, you can say chemical, atomic geometry, a molecular formula, or whatever terminology fits your mind. So in 2005, I launched the Journal of Human Liver Dynamics. So people would send me articles. We received maybe 80 articles and published about 35 and went for peer review. So when people started using anthropomorphic ideas mixed with thermodynamics, the heat phase started to happen between 2007 and 2008. And the, this is where the confusion started arising. Where, how, do you, how do you explain, use uh, terms such as life or bio or vitalism in terms of energy, joules? You cannot specifically say go down the evolution chain from humans to hydrogen. I wore about a special shirt today. I was bring a special shirt for every lecture. How many people saw the uh, Bill, Bill Nye, the science guy versus Ken Ham? At 10 million views, anybody saw it? Okay. Well, Ken Ham is a theist and he takes the Bible literally, which means that life started on the fifth day of creation. So his objection is, if you have molecules to man evolution, at what point does life start? So this kind of question came into the fore here in, 2000, in 2007, 2008. So from a... <laughs> Ludwig Butcher is he, he's one of the he's ranked as an extreme atheist. And he's one of the, he wrote uh, Force of Matter in 1855. He says man reacts with woman just as hydrogen reacts with oxygen. <laughs> and this is the modern. Granted, we're talking about a simple mechanism here. We're just talking about two small small two element molecules reacting to form another two element molecule and it's a one step mechanism. Human reactions are large, more complex versions of that. But from a chemical thermodynamic point of view. You can't specifically say when a mechanism turns into a living mechanism because you end up with Jabberwocky. So when I started writing the uh, Encyclopedia of Human Thermodynamics or HMOpedia, two months ago I just published a 10 volume print set of the whole thing. So this is different from Wikipedia when you get, uh, when you try to define biothermodynamics, you end up with loop recursive definition, you end up citing living organisms and you write an article on living organisms, you end up with something that has the properties of life. Then you go down to life, and you the only way to solve this problem is you can either be emergentist and say that at a certain point, this is where life started, or you can be a scale of the concept of life down to the atom, or below to subatomic levels, which is where you start becoming kind of new aging, and uh, this is where the difficulties start. So, for example, uh, Hazen here, Robert Hazen who wrote a book called uh, Genesis, Scientific Quest for Life Origin. He says, an attempt to distinguish between life and non-life represents a false dichotomy. So then you go down here and you, he advocates a multiple step evolution. So there's a step here where a certain type of property of life came, and there's another step. At the University of Texas a and instead of saying a human is a, a living primate mammal, you can cite Anabali uh, uh, is part of our, one of our editors in Journal of Human Thermodynamics, and he teaches his students that human is a 26 element heat driven atomic su structure. So now we stuff, substitute mythological or anthropomorphic labeling with uh, <coughs> physical, chemically neutral terminology. So now we're going to talk about right here. Alfred Rogers has the same point of view. He has a website called Life Does Not Exist. So to conclude, I'm going to show a quick three minute video of him. He made for this talk, but he couldn't come because he had hip surgery three, three, uh, three weeks ago. He's an American philosopher. He was stuck, he's trained in pharmacology. So he says that life does not exist. And I'm going to show you, I'll, I'll play the audio and you can watch it online. Here's the concluding point of view here. And I'll show you the video. From the old view was that, the Diderot Tyndall view was that there was first there was non-living back in the 18th, 19th and 17th century. Then bio started at a certain point and merged and now we have living. Then between the latter half of the 20th century, we have the Mark Willis Kaufman view, where you start getting these perpetual motion. It's not being, perpetual motion. Okay, well, let me just finish. It's stability far from equilibrium. That's, that's the okay, self wait, 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 wait. We just finished. I'll play the video. Let him finish. He said three times perpetual motion. It's not. Okay, I, will, I won't. Uh, let me just finish. So we have these reactions that cycle back on each other. Now the new view is that instead of living coming from non-living, if you use the word animate, you can say that carbon has the property of animation. When light shines on it, and the, this geometry changes, and that's where we get our mind from. So this is called the Thames-Rogers-Jaber view. 
three different people independently have arrived at this view. In early biology classes, uh, it became clear that they didn't understand when or how life first developed from non-life. And so I began to wonder, well, maybe it didn't. Maybe there is no real difference between life and non-life. So I created a, a web, web page called lifedoesnotexist.com with many other ideas uh, in, the, in the 1990s. Uh, some of the evidence for this is a uh, Brett Cooper study in 2014 when they artificially created a, a plant virus. Uh, they took non-living things and from this created a plant virus that lived, that was able to function as a living virus. And then in 2007, there was a study in Maryland when they handcrafted a, uh, a chromosome which functioned as a normal chromosome in a normal cell. And Kay Biddle had a study where uh, she revived microorganisms that had been uh, inactive for 100,000 to 8 million years old under Arctic ice. And uh, they were able to function again as living things, which makes you wonder how can something be dead for that long and still be alive. And then the common seed, where you have a, a, a lots of plants that go to into a seed mode, and the seed uh, you would not call alive because it is not doing anything, but then it can come back to being what we call alive uh, when it gives enough heat and moisture. I'm just going to summarize what he says here. He says when he started taking biology classes, they gave vague definitions of differentiation between life and non-life. So he arrived at the view in the 1990s that what you just described as life and non-life is a matter of complexity. So for example, in the old days they would call a geyser, before they understood the principles of its operation, they might have contributed to some kind of god of the earth. Now we understand a geyser isn't alive. The same way with the sun, the Egyptians thought the sun was alive. Now we understand the principle of operation of the sun physically, and we don't define the sun as live anymore. So he decided, and if, through his philosophical readings, for example, he talks about Ray Kurzweil, which you cite in the video here. He says that uh, from a physical, if you look, go back and far enough, you're going to get to a thing that's a physical chemical process. And to find that as live, you end up with Jabberwocky. So he started a website called lifedoesnotexist.com. Now, why do we call some things living and some things not living? I, I don't know that. Probably complexity is one of the big reasons if something is fairly simple and we can see how it works, then we normally don't consider it to be alive. But most of the things we do consider to be alive are very complex and it's very hard to see how they got to be the way that they are. And also our, our understanding of uh, time, because our lifespan is so short, only like 70 years, it's hard to understand what happens in, in millions of years. The, the very slight changes there, so that the first life that uh, we've been able to identify was about 500 million years after the Earth came into being. And we can see the way that it was then, but if we could go back maybe 100 million years and see what it looked like that at that time, we would probably, we might consider it to be just some kind of a, a physiochemical reaction rather than something totally different, which we would call life. Anybody have any questions? Back there, question. So a lot of these presentations, I've been sort of waiting to hear uh, and haven't mention of uh, uh, Harold Morowitz, who did most of this stuff way back in the 60s. Yeah, Harold Morowitz, he's one of the founders of, uh, he was one of the first persons to apply thermodynamics to bio yeah. process. But Morowitz ended up becoming a uh, closet theist at the end. That's where his arguments became cloudy. Well, yeah, but you well, kind of get beyond you, that. If you crouch your arguments, if you have some kind of something vested in whatever your belief system, say you're 
you're a uh, religion is Star Wars, and you think that life came from metachlorians. I'm talking about you. way back when energy yeah. flowed through biology. Yeah. So Basically had it nailed right then. The I don't care is, what's happened since then. Okay. So the problem is you get to a certain <laughs> atomic configuration. You go back in time to 3.5 million years, we have fossilized bacteria. But if you go back in time, you have to chemical thermodynamically say, well, how does this energy flow to this atomic geometry constitute life? Because you can take the mechanism back and say, well, maybe this is the right mechanism. If you keep going backwards with energy flow, hydrogen react with hydrogen, forming helium is an energy flow process. You got to the walk. Yeah. I'd like to say one sentence. I think there's something interesting that uh, Howard Oden talked about, about hurricanes and stars being uh, self-constructing devices that pull energy out of the environment to maintain their own structure. Self-organization. Self-organization that is interesting to me along the line of what you're talking about. Next. Thank you very much.